Hello, ladies and gents. Uh, I am joined here today by Mr. Terry McCoy, one of our coaches who's been coaching with us for five years. Yeah, yeah, getting on for six now, I think. Getting on for six years. Um, yeah. And uh, today we're going to be discussing um, his approach to uh, helping the victims of narcissistic abuse, overcome narcissistic abuse, and complex complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Mr. McCoy, thank you very much for coming on. How have you been, sir? Absolute pleasure. I will be great. You've been great. Much the same as ever. Yeah, we had a tailored wagon. How, <laughs> how's... Um, How's things been in the world of uh, coaching? Has much changed in the uh, six years that you have bravely laboured alongside me? As Have you changed your approach? Uh, absolutely. I've, I've laid a, Started out doing what you told years. me to do and then I spewed all that off because it was nonsense. <laughs> yeah. I thought, you know what? I'm going to do something that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, as you know, the first, the first, uh, what, six months maybe, it was mm. helping people go through the CPTSD course, wasn't it? It Supporting was. Them through that. Yeah. yeah. Um, great course. It, that, that was a really good course. Um, was that Science and, and a Critic? No, no. It was before that. Oh, it was before that. Wow. God, you have yeah, been there yeah, a long yeah. time. Yeah. It was two, 2017 or 2018, not sure. Long time, long, long time. Yeah, yeah. So there was that. Yes, I remember now. There's a structured course for helping people reduce their emotional flashbacks and develop their emotional. That's literature. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was a learning curve. The self as you know, being being a coach for the last twenty years. Mm. Um, and my previous experience was PTSD and CPTSD to a certain degree. Yeah, but it was usually um, the vast majority of it was via uh, or through. Accidents, people have been in accidents, serious accidents, whether it's a car crash or explosions, but whatever, different types of accidents. Um, so, and what I found was a lot of the, the, the principles were easily applied to CPTSD. Yes. You know, um, one, of the, one of the major sort of eye openers, and I know I've mentioned this before, but one of the major eye openers for me uh, was giving them a sense of validation. Mm. The the vast majority of the feedback that we, that we and Steve got as well, you know, remember Steve was with us, um, you know, but a lot of them it's the first time they've been believed. And is that and for that is that a big part of the recovery process for the victims of narcissistic abuse? It's a, it's a big start, yeah. To be to just be believed, validated in the feelings, you know, yeah, validated in, in whatever the feeling. Mm. No right, wrong, wrong. It's, it's, it's what you feel in that moment. So presumably that's because in the narcissistically abusive relationship, a lot of their feelings are invalidated. They're getting the opposite of that. So what was that? Uh, presumably the reason why um, they like to be validated in their feelings is because inside of the narcissistically abusive relationship, their feelings are invalidated. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, something else. I thought I heard something in the background. I sort of thought it was on your side. Just ghosts. Just the, the, the demons. Is that ghosts? It's the demons that follow. I told you, folks. Yeah. Ghosts, I told you, folks, on WhatsApp. Yeah, Terry left me a WhatsApp today. And um, before before his voice came through, there was a loud farting sound. <laughs> Not responsible. <laughs> so play that back. Play back your own WhatsApp voice. So there's a farting sound at the beginning of I that. Know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um i think yeah because it, it makes sense to me like people are, are trapped isolated in these narcissistically abusive relationships and um of course part of the gaslighting process is that nothing they feel is valid nothing they they perceive is has got any merit so you spend a lot of time or you spend some time uh, validating their their reality, their experience, and their feelings. It, it actually came as a natural process because you're talking to people who've been through it. But for the most part, it's it's hell of a terrible time, horrendous time, you know. And to just sit and listen mm. without judgment, mm. without interpretation. I, 
from what I'm, you know, the feedback that they get. No, they don't get it. They they don't get that often. Yeah. Even with so you know with, with I mean you you know yourself you've heard some stories of counsellors saying you know well you know what you'll be doing she's sure it's not you. Mm-hmm. you know, come on. <laughs> I had a counsellor say that to me. Are you sure that narcissistic well, you. personality disorder really exists, Mr. Grant? And I was like, I specifically chose you as a counsellor <laughs> because you said you're an expert in narcissistic abuse. And now you're asking me whether it even exists. This is like gaslighting at the next level. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, I've, had, I've had my own bad experiences. But yeah, I've had loads of clients tell me of absolute horror stories with therapists and counsellors. Hmm. Yeah, so... Again, it's that validation comes in a natural force. You know, you know perfectly valid. It's ju- it just is listening. The fact that someone's listening without judgment and prejudice. Yeah. Which, which you should do as a coach anyway. Yes. If you're doing your job. Yeah. How much of I, I, use, I use job in a, you know, quotation marks. Mm. Mm. It's not a job. It's a, it's what I love doing. It's a calling. It's, just love doing. <laughs> it's a calling, yes. <laughs> I let my ego yes. sit to one side and then the angels of God just speak through me. How you much... too. <laughs> yeah, me too, brother. Me too. Um, hallelujah. Alhamdulillah. How much um, of that, like listening and, and just letting people be, do you do you credit to your background in, in Buddhism? Is that a big part of what you learned through studying Buddhism? Yeah. Um... I, I, I wouldn't want to attribute to any one thing. I think it's just experience in, in general. Right. You know, in, in you know, even the NLP, you know, mm. like, it, like it's got it's got its detractors, it's got, but there's some really useful uh, processes within that. Mm. And one of the things I was taught was just keep that shut. Mm. Listen, 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 listen. You know, you can get a lot from people's language, just listen to people. Mm. You know, um, and but yeah, Buddhism is a big. I mean, <laughs> I think uh, I think I've mentioned this, and it, it formed part of a course I'm, I'm creating actually. Uh, you know the, the the four noble truths. Mm-hmm. You know, um, my version of it is the the shit happens model. Okay, I've well, not heard that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Go on. Um, from the four noble truths to shit happens. To shit Sorry, happens ladies model. and gentlemen, yeah. he's from Liverpool. I can't control him. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I've got some noble <laughs> truths for you, dear. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you them right now. <laughs> I know what to drink. <laughs> what is a <it>, suit? <laughs> um, only because I couldn't think. I, I was teaching it on a practitioner course, going to build because I folded into a practitioner course. Mm. And I was trying to think my name, and one of the lads said, Well, my, well that's, that's, yeah, that's cool. I wouldn't even know. It's just happened well, you know. By mm. by by that I don't mean oh shit. What mm. I mean is, and as you know, as the the the, the first noble truth, you know, if you go with the noble first noble truth, you you don't you know life is suffering. Mm. You know, the, my version. Everyone, we we we're, we're all going to get old. We're all going to we're all going <laughs> we're all going to die. Mm. Hey, you know, <laughs> we're all going to experience sickness. We're all going to experience you know ups and downs, right? You know, um, these are events, mm. right? Um, we have very little control. What causes the, the what causes the dis this ease, if you like, or the distress, or the yeah, I'll, I'll use distress or whatever. It is. I'll use you know, depending on the it would be depression or whatever. It is, is when people think, well, my life is this way. Mm. It should be this way. I want it to be this way. I want him. I want him or her to be this way. Does that make sense? And mm. it's that gap, that gap that causes the distress. And it's the the insistence, or you know, in in Buddhism, it's craving, mm. right? But it would mean it's, it's the insistence or the wishing the, the, the that that it should be another way. It should be this way. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we spend most of our time, or a lot, a lot of people spend most of the time, ruminating or. or Think about that. Well, it should be this way. It must mm. be this way. The world, other people, me, right? When we say, oh, we accept, right? This is where we are. Whether we like it or not, right? This is where we are. What do we need to do to close the gap between that and 
what I want. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. It's acceptance is the third step, if you like, of the, mm. of the model. So, the, the, so I was going to say the fourth step, you know, you, as you know, with Buddhism, is the middle way, the middle path, mm -hmm. you know, the, the eightfold path. It sort of feeds into DBT, the electrical behavioral therapy, where where you, where your the the main core of the of the model or the methodology, if you like, is to be able to hold two things at once, hold two thoughts, two conflicting thoughts at once, almost like stroking your cat, you know, you, you know. So, for instance, uh, I want to be successful, but I'm stressed out. They're giving me loads of work. Mm. Right, so it is acceptance of okay. So I, I want, I want to be successful in work, but I'm get, I'm overloaded. I'm stressed out. So it's finding that middle balance by creating boundaries and uh, and accepting what you can do and what you can't do, and letting go of the rest. Does that make sense? So it's it's that middle way. That's one of the core tenets of DBC. Anyway, um, the other one is mindfulness, as you probably know. Mm. I think Marcelina did had... that make sense? Hmm. Mm, did. I think Marsha Linehan is a practicing Buddhist. I think yeah. that's, where, that's where she developed it from, was from Buddhism. There's a, I don't know whether she wrote it, actually, I'm not sure, but there's a really good book called The Buddha, the Buddha in the Borderline. I'm not sure whether she wrote it or not, but, it's, but it, she's heavily mentioned in the book. And so it, it tells a story of a lady who was a borderline personality disorder, went through mm. all of these different therapies finally ended up in DBT with mm. possibly Marsha Hannah, I'm not sure. Um, or she was trained by Marsha, uh, uh, you know, the, what was her name, Marsha? Lenahan. 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 Good Irish She was trained by her. Ah, right. Um, and it was one of the few, well, one of the few things that actually worked for her. And she was able to keep a, uh, quite a sort of um, cap on, a, on the temperament, if that makes sense. She, Built up on emotional regulation, you know, ex uh, distress tolerance, uh, and it worked for it. So, for people who don't know, um, there's a lady called Marcia Linehan who developed a type of therapy called dialectical behavioral therapy, and it's based some some of it is based on uh, principles from Buddhism, and it's been shown to be very very effective with borderline personality disordered clients. But it's also very effective with people who've been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I was just going to say that. Yeah. So, when it comes to helping the the your clients who've been the victims of narcissistic abuse, the um, model that we were just talking about, where we said, okay, there's what things are, and then there's the way things you want them to be, and in in that gap, there's suffering. You padna. See, I'm obnoxious. I know the Sanskrit. It's you padna. Oof punch me in my face and you when you say sanskrit words you should do it with your nose in the air you padna just like that yeah, right okay yeah. you padna um no, I'll how, does, how does that how does that um fit with uh the victims of narcissistic abuse is there is, do they experience this gap between their partner's behavior and, and what they're actually experiencing um they will do when I'm working with with my, you know, with, with clients, my 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 basic steps are okay. This you've been through a lot, mm. hell of a lot, right? And this is this. I think this is really important for, for people to get hold of. But they've got a future. Mm. You know, doesn't matter how old you are. You could be eighty odd. You know, as you probably know, but some of my clients have been in, in the seventies. Mm. You know, mid seventies. You know, you've got a future. That that future depends on the decisions that you make today. Mm -hmm. Now, right? Even the very small ones, just the small steps. How do you want? How do you want your life to be instead? Does that make sense? And it's yeah. it, it's knowing the background, knowing what's going on, know, knowing what the, that they need support, but supporting them through that process, making those steps towards the solution. Solution focused. So, we said that you said that validation was very important um, for for your clients. 
what else is important to help them recover? What have you found that, that works very well? Self-care, if they do it, okay. if they take it on board. Um, what is self-care? The re, the re, well, look, basically looking after yourself, you know, eating the right stuff, getting it, hydrating, um, eating, eating properly, um, having a stru- also having a structure, uh, a, a, a structure, especially in the morning. One one of my clients, she's doing the, it's it's took a while, but now she, what she she's got on the wall, it it's a, basically you know, uh, a graph, and she's got um, meditation, um, elliptical machine, breakfast, and she ticks it off, boom, boom, boom. and she you know now and again, now and again she'll fall, you know she'll fall off the wagon, and it's important for them to know as well that when they fall off the wagon, I think that. It's it's a lapse. It's not a relapse. It's a lapse. It's just one, and it's just, okay. I missed out one day. Go back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because well, you get a lot of people, or you can get a lot of people say, "Oh, that's it." Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. So the the reason I say self care as well is uh, if you look at all the therapies, all the major therapies, they've all got an element of self care, and they all you know DBT, uh, CBT. Acceptance and commitment te- therapy focused, um, focused therapy. The, the the other one, all those therapies. Go the third wave of therapies that are based. You know, there's got a lot of Buddhism, Buddhist processes within them. They all focus on self care. When when you say self care, it sounded like you were talking about living within a certain disciplined structure. And a schedule mm-hmm. is that important? An important part of self care for for you? For the start, yeah. To start with, yeah, just get mm-hmm. some structure. Oh, someone I know very well, um, not a client, but a, um, outside. She knows that if she stays in bed, she's mm-hmm. going to go downhill. Right. So as soon as she wakes up, the first thing she does, gets up, doesn't stay in bed. She gets a shower. Puts her makeup on, gets dressed, goes downstairs, has a breakfast, goes for the 40 minute walk religiously every day. But you know, now and again, maybe you know, the weather might be, you know, it's icy because she's mm. old, you know, but that's her, that's her routine. And to her, she knows if she keeps up to that, she keeps up, keeps on top of that, she it sets it up for the day. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Yeah. I think even the average person would do would do okay with a routine in the morning. You yeah. know, just get boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So um when clients are working with you, um, do you have like a, a certain procedure that you take every client through or or do you tailor it to each individual client's needs? Tailor it. It's anything else is prescriptive. Okay. It doesn't work. What's wrong with being prescriptive? Tell me about being prescriptive. Yeah. Well, every, everyone's unique. Aren't they? All right, we've got, they, they, they'll be certain things in common, right? Yeah. But each person's got their own. Each person's got their own perception of, of what's going on, and their view of the world, and what they're capable of, and what they're not capable of. So for me, it's having. A, a main structure in, in place, if you like, as in, okay, what what do you want? What does the client want? I know, you know what what do you want to achieve, and whatever I'm doing, whatever we're doing, however we would go about it, there's always that end in mind. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Because sometimes we have to go, you know, sort of take a step back. You know, yeah. When when clients tell you that they that they've really enjoyed uh, working with you and really enjoyed the coaching with you, is there anything specifically that they say like, "Oh, this was good" or "or that was good" that they really appreciate? Um, they tend to they, they they tend to comment on the on the 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 Socratic question in a that makes sense. Yeah, you know, um, getting them to think in a particular way or a tell different way to the way do you think. Tell the good people who have no fucking clue what you're talking about. What Socratic question? Critical thinking. Critical well, thinking. Critical thinking. You know. And tell the good know, people who have no fucking clue okay. what you're talking about what critical thinking is. <laughs> I 
don't, do tend get, to do that. Don't, don't, I? don't, get, don't get technical. <laughs> okay. I know um, what you. I know well, what you mean. I, they don't. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll, I'll explain the way I explain it. Right? Yeah. The brain's really good at doing three things. It makes stuff up, groups stuff together, and leaves stuff out. Right. Even before we're consciously aware of it. Right. In our language, you know, I'll cut it short. Right. We're not. We're not even consciously aware of that. Right. So. So. A belief is a great example. Mm. A belief is a, a, a belief. When you think about it, it's a conclusion that you come to as a result of things got, that have gone on in the past. That makes it, it making sense so far. Yes, sir. So, um, that conclusion is be, maybe based on one particular example or three or four examples. But when we say, like for instance, I'm not good at relationships, we use that language. Our nervous system acts. On that language, you know, it doesn't say, "Well, well actually, you're, you're all right at some." Mm. We just act on that that comment, and for that to be true, it's it's um, I'm never been good at any relationships whatsoever in any way, shape, or form in any context. Mm -hmm. I'm not now, and I never will be in the future. <laughs> yeah. You know, in any way, shape, or form, I'm right. So <laughs> there is no I'm possibility not... on any quantum reality that I will ever be good yeah. at. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, that's effectively what's happening. Yeah. So critical thinking is getting us to think, of, okay, well, look, what it, where is this not true? You know, how do you know? Well, I'm basing it on three, three, three examples, say, for instance, as well, I was engaged when I was 17 and that fell through when I, I went out with someone when I was 21 and that didn't happen. It didn't happen then I, and I was in, married for five years, that didn't happen, you know? Mm when we look critically at these things and say, well, there were different, we, I'm picking, I'm sort of, a, this is sort of a montage of the number of clients now. You know, we look at the different reasons why these didn't happen the way we wanted to happen. It wasn't all then. It was just one of them, for instance, just sort of fizzled out. No one's fault. No one's fault. You just did decide each other wasn't, for each, they went for each other and they, they went away. Yeah. Um, so my, 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 um, what I tend to go for or tend to try and try to hear is okay, counter examples to that to that belief. So for instance, well, you, you know, well with your your friends, you've got friends, you know, and you, and you have had relationships that have gone all right, you just, you know, they ran the course and you finished them. So they were okay in their time. Uh so look for counter examples in the past, but also start creating experiences where that belief doesn't hold. In the future does that make sense mm. yeah it does it does yeah. and so um i like the socratic method i i got mm. caught by a uh, dr paul taylor he said that i was dementedly psychotic uh, dementedly psychotic dementedly socratic he might have said i was dementedly psychotic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. dementedly socratic. both really <laughs> uh, i think it's it's the pre pre-critical thinking isn't it you know you have to determine if you're in a debate with somebody, each side has to determine the opponent's position better than the opponent can define it themselves to the opponent's full satisfaction, which means you really have to thoroughly define what you're talking about when you express a belief to the nth degree. And of course, yeah. Socrates being so clever and wise found that many arguments between two people just fell apart. They could no longer argue because they simply didn't understand the other person's position. Now that can happen with parts inside of the human mind, different parts of the human mm. mind can get into these arguments, or we can get into an argument with reality because we just haven't defined the terms very well. Critical thinking being just, you know, you just critique your own thinking. You have a thought, you say, I'm yeah. crap at relationships. And then the critical thinking response would be always. Or is, is, there that true? is, is that yeah. true? How do you know that that's true? This is critical thinking. This is the Socratic method. Um, how, how do you know is is the the the, the six million dollar question for me? Because that's the, that, the, you you get into the beliefs then. Well, how, how do you know this is true? Then you'll get the beliefs and the values even for a lot of the time. We're back. We're back out of psychology again and back into philosophy a little bit, which I like but to. We, yeah, I love it. How do you? How know? should I live? How should you live? And how do you know that's how you should live? Where are you getting mm -hmm. this information from? And it's not, it's an endless question, isn't it? It's not that you try to create a new dogma 
you and the client are going to write the new orthodoxy, the new Ten Commandments. It's that no. just that you're practicing, you're practicing thinking, you're practicing developing ethics and a morality and a way of life. Well, it, it, there's there's a, another uh, very important point. Uh, I think what a lot of people miss out on and, and don't know until it's brought to them, the values. Mm. No, having a good, I, I, again, from six years of doing this, one of the most useful things I think you can do is get a real strong hold on your values, view on your values. Mm. You know, um, it makes it for, for, is, from my point of view, it makes it a lot easier to, to create boundaries and enforce them. It's not the be all and end all, but it's it's a good, it's a great start. It also answers the question, how should it, I I I would rather than say how should you live, because that's a bit that's a bit of a real thing, isn't it? That's sort of this is how you should live. How do I want to live? How do I want to live? I know it's a bit, you know, it's a bit different to the than was it Epictetus who said it? Or Nietzsche I'm not sure. Can't it said Epictetus. What? Said what? How should I live? Was that an Epictetus question? How should I live? I think so, yeah. I think it's an important question that all human beings have to answer, which is how should a person live? And we're failing to answer it. We're failing to answer it right now, which I think makes people very, very vulnerable to narcissistic abuse because if everything is everything and it's just all about consumption and doing whatever you want, why not get into a narcissistically abusive relationship? How how um, important do you think the concept of temptation is in narcissistically abusive relationships? Because they're not usually putting a gun to people's heads and saying, right, you're in a relationship with me. There's usually an element of coercion, isn't there? Um, yeah, and also, um, and again, this is only, I'm going by what I've found from mm. experience, so I'm not saying this is true for all people all the time mm. in that situation, but for a lot of people, there's a fear. They would rather be in a, an abuse. I'm going to say rather be in a abusive. The the idea of being in a relationship, even though it's abusive, is more appealing at at, at that time than being lonely, being alone. I think a lot of people are scared of being alone. Does that make sense? It does. It would also indicate that we're probably living through some sort of a loneliness epidemic. Or pandemic. You can see it yourself, can't you? you know, the world's geared, you know, the so the world's geared for couples. You know. Well, if I'm on my own, you know, who's who's gonna look after me? Who's gonna be, you know, who's gonna be who's gonna be having back? Well, you know, that's a common, yeah, common divide a lot of people. And I, I just want someone to have me back. Well, and let, let's let's teach you let's let's teach you to have your own back. Mm. So when you go into a relationship, you're going into a relationship because you want to be there and you're independent. You've got your own sort of independent sovereignty, whatever you want to call it. Yes, yes, I I, I do I, I support that. Like the idea that individuals should do as much as they can for themselves. I do wonder if there are real serious societal questions that we have to answer though. Why are people so lonely now when they weren't, let's say, in the 80s? It's not that long ago, like 40 years ago. Nobody, nobody was talking about a pandemic of loneliness. And what do we do mm. to resolve that? Because narcissists thrive in an environment where they can easily isolate their targets. Now, if the target is pre-isolated, that's one less thing for the narcissist to do, isn't it? We've got to get people, I, I would think, Bringing back communities would probably do a lot to to help uh, uh, combat yeah. the, the narcissism uh, problem. It, one of the um, a, a common um, comment that I get from people is when, when you know they know that outside the, the they've come through the 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 hard part of your life and now they're going well, you know, I've lost my friends, I've lost my family, I've got you know, I'm, I'm living on my own. Mm. You know, um, what do we do now? Yeah. Um, Okay, so first start look start looking for groups. Start looking for for area where you can get out and talk to people. Yes. You know, find interest, find interest. You know, okay, I've never things that you've never tried before. You know, okay, well let's let's have a go with that dance class. Whatever it might be, 
but get out and start mixing with people, talking to people, being in company, being in a community, creating your own. Very important. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It's very important, especially as marriage rates go down. Um, I think people have to now, sadly, have to, in an artificial way, create communities. Um, but it's better to artificially create a community and make an effort and develop those kinds of friendships than it is to get stuck with some horrible, torturous monster in a relationship mm. that slowly sucks your soul out. Yeah. What would you... Uh, uh, sorry, go on. No, okay. No, I was going to say a, 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 a real a strong example of that over the years would have been working with people who suffered domestic violence. You get people saying, or, you know, people who was working with, you know, colleagues who were saying, why does she just leave? Or why doesn't he just leave? But I would. <laughs> you know, and it's I think it's the most thoughtless question to 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 to, to ask. Mm. You know, maybe a, a useful question. And this was a question that was brought up by um I can't remember her name, but she was the she may be still still uh, in that position. She she was the head of domestic violence with the Metropolitan Police. Mm. You know, the her question was, what would make it what would make what would make it in that, that woman's or person's best interest to stay? That was a much more useful question mm. for her, you know. Um, and I think it is, it, 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 it's, you know, it, it's like being you know, okay. What makes this behaviour? As I often ask, ask myself, or, or in, at times with other, you know, with clients, in order for what you're doing to be the right thing to do, not morally or whatever, just the behaviour to be make perfect sense to you. What 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 must be going on? What what might you believe about yourself, the world? Mm. The universe, if you like, you know, I have no control. You know, the world's about the nasty place. You know, does this make sense? Mm. And once you've got them, you start working with those. Yeah. The 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 example I was going to uh, I was going to finish off, if you like, was this person. She was it, was it was a physically abusive relationship, and yet every time we spoke to her, it was. Ah oh, yeah, but I'm going. I'm yeah. You know, I'm setting. I'm, I'm going next week, or I'm setting up next week. But we knew it wasn't going to happen because. And in the end, she did say to us, to me, "Well, if I go, who's going to happen with two kids? Who's going to happen with two children?" That was that was her thinking. Yeah. You yeah. Know? It's very no, very. We both know. So I was going to say we both know. That's a massive generalize. That's a that's, that's predicting the future. To generalization, you know, you can't, no, you, she can't know that no one would have it. There are lots of people in that position, male and female. Does that make sense? Mm. But she's already confining herself. Okay, this terrible situation is actually more, more tolerable than the thought of being on my own. Yeah, because people who are traumatized and have PTSD engage in black and white thinking, catastrophic mm -hmm. thinking, and they're not really uh, having the luxury of being able to think clearly at all. And that can be physiological because they're hyperadrenalized all the time, they're hypervigilant, if they're experiencing violence and it goes on for long enough. Even the uh, the hippocampal volume shrinks. So they can. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. The, the, the capacity to assign emotion to situations in an appropriate problem way. Problem solving, this problem solving, decision making, all that goes out the window. You, you, you know yourself. I mean, in a high stress situation, martial arts. In a, it, when you're in a high stress situation, I, you you know the guy, one of the guy who, we, who, who I used to train with, um, and he would put you in in a really high stress best situation so that you know you would just go you can say his name he, he wouldn't mind if he said his name oh simon simon squires simon squires One of Den yeah dennis, dennis, dennis martin, martin's, martin's lads yeah, yeah so the, yeah. for people who don't know this is like it's self-defense but they really focused a focus still on the emotional and psychological stress elements of it yeah. okay, sorry go, they, go on. they would they would put you under severe uh, or, or, or replicate severe stress. Right? So you'd be working out for whatever, you know, putting you on the pads, whatever. And then for the final 
minute they bring the padded man out. Mm. And so, you know, you, 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 you're stressed out, you shut, people shouting down your ear, right? Now, all the karate in the world, unless you've got your head screwed on, it's not going to happen. You, you, you revert to a few, and that was, the, that was the, the theory behind it, you revert to a few basic moves that you practice, 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 practice throughout, so that even under high stress, mm. you, you perform reasonably well. And that was Dennis Martin. Dennis Martin used to say that. The idea is to, not to be able to perform brilliantly under moderate stress, is to perform reasonably well under extreme stress. Mm. Mm. You know, um, all that to say, I know we sort of went off on a bit of a tangent, but, and you know what I'm like for tangents, yeah, uh, you know, your decision making and problem solving goes out the window. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you doubt yourself, you doubt every decision that you make. I've been in that position many, 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 many years ago. You know, it's uh, not a nice way to be. You were in that position through an abusive relationship or through a violence? No, no not, not a violent relationship, no, no. Just, just a, a, you know what, I can't even honestly say it was abusive. It was just... Uh... Terry, if you didn't consent, it was abuse. Abuse is abuse, call it out. <laughs> no, it's just, I've been in situations where I've been walking on eggshells, put it down, but not you know, a that's physical. That's abuse. Yeah, okay, right. okay. 100% abuse, 100%. I'm, 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 a, I'm a purist on these things. Like, if you're, <laughs> if you're walking on eggshells, uh, you're being emotionally manipulated, you didn't consent to the emotional manipulation, and it's abuse. Um, and now there are people who say, oh, you're calling everything abuse. And I'm like, well, a lot of things that people fucking get away with is abuse. It's simply abuse. Yeah. If you don't consent to it, and it doesn't make you feel good, whatever it is, whatever the relationship is, I'm abusing you. 100%, 100%, cuz abuse is like it's misuse. You if you didn't consent to that, you 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 you're being misused. We didn't even talk about trauma bonding in terms of like some of these abusive relationships and just the fact that mm. when you're talking male female, women when they engage in a relationship with a man and they have sex with a man and they sleep with a man, they're basically I think it's hard for men to understand they're basically having sex in a relationship with a bear, tiger, boar pig that could kill them in a, in, a, in a fit of rage that would take about 25 seconds, 30 seconds. And we mm -hmm. don't live with that. We don't, have to, we don't have to live with that threat. And it happens. You know, men beat women to death. Yeah. You know, hopefully... Not often, but it, it does happen even in the UK. It happens. And I think I think that adds to the element of the trauma bonding. It adds to it. I think I don't want to get too too deep into it now, but like um unraveling that and unraveling what's going on neurologically if you're trapped inside of that kind of a relationship with that level of intense fear where you know that you and or your children could be stamped to death. Um is is gonna it's really gonna scramble people's brains it's something we it's something we discuss discuss elsewhere but it is relevant to the narcissistically abuse that's like physically abusive relationships with a psychopath it's relevant to the emotional abuse of the narcissist because that threat even if it's not physical some of the threats and you know this better than i do um are perceived by the central nervous system exactly as though they were physical threats there's parts of you that that's can't it. Yeah. Seniority fires. What did you say? Seniority the fires. Se <laughs> the seniority fires. <laughs> but I love the first one. That sounded better. Seniority fires. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If I'm not drinking, maybe you should. <laughs> it sounded like Craig from Big Brother for a second there. The same neurology fires. Ladies and gents, the same neurology fires. <laughs> I know Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll put my Oxford Oxford accent on there. Listen, you the live in the world. You live. You live in the world now. You should be. You should. You should be speaking. Um, I can't remember where are you from in Liverpool. Like, I can never remember. You told me before. I. That's where I spent most of my time. Right. Well, I I won't take the piss anymore because I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let I'll you. I'm the hiding mafia around my house. 
Yeah. Yeah, you boot boys. Lads, what were you saying about Heighton? You're getting it now. <laughs> um any final thoughts for the victims of narcissistic abuse? Anything that they can start doing that helps them to get out of uh, narcissistically abusive relationships? Make a plan is one. Yeah. Um, that that comes from uh, working with the domestic on the domestic violence side. Even if they, even if they are not going to do it yet, start making a plan. Whether that's you know keep putting you know getting things away, you know find a place to live. Put money away, um, self care. Start looking after himself, themselves. Um, yeah, but make a plan. Start, you know, move, start looking forward. And re- and also about yeah. Ex- accept that what you feel is what you feel. It's 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 perfectly valid. Does that make sense? It does. If people want to get coaching from you, where's the best, what's the most direct and bestest way for them to go about doing that? Well, the most direct and bestest way. Mm, best effort. Is, is, to, <laughs> is to contact me, Teddy at SpartanLifeCoach.com. Excellent. Terry at SpartanLifeCoach.com. Uh, yeah. If you want coaching, if you want help, uh, overcoming a narcissistic abusive relationship and the CPTSD that results from that. Terry consistently gets amazing feedback from clients who I send his way. So I highly recommend working with Terry. Um, and as you can tell from this conversation, he's gentle and nice man and much more patient than I am. It's so. an act. <laughs> Got two horns and a tail. Um, for those of you who didn't understand him, he said he has two horns and a tail but it came out as, it? i've got i've got two horns and a tail i'm from Aiton, and i'll you'll catch me fighting in a minute if you keep taking the <laughs> yeah. piss out of my accent you're getting it yeah i'm just yeah, i'm just going out for a scrap now <laughs> but so so is it make it clear to everybody that i do how um i do supply subtitles if there's a problem the Americans would be like, what is this quaint Scottish accent you guys are using right now? It's from well, Liverpool. that's what I get, actually. Are you, and, you Irish? And ling- no. Irish or Scottish. Linguists have been yeah. wondering for years, what was the yeah. what was the source of the development of this accent? Nobody knows. This is just how it this is just how it went. The Irish came here and then they started going, hey, you, you fucking zippy and that. Um, Terry, it was a pleasure to have you. Um, and I hope that people do uh, get in contact with you and get help from you. That would be an awesome outcome from this conversation. Pleasure, always a pleasure, Richard. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and uh, for your attention. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again soon.